Aloha class. Uh, in this module, module one, we're going to be looking at taking apart a computer and putting it back together. And this is uh, a lot of fun. It's also terrifying when you're taking apart a computer that works because uh, when you take it all apart, you have to put it back together and it has to work. And if you come up and you've got a couple of screws left over and you're wondering where did those go? Yeah, it can be a little bit uh, unnerving. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into the PowerPoint presentation here. So I'm going to share my screen and <laughs> here we go, I believe. So um, I am going to clear this out of the way. So uh, our book that we're using is uh, CompTIA A+, Guide to IT uh, Technical Support. The material uh, that I'm gonna be covering right now uh, is a uh, overview of that material. And uh, it's not as detailed. You're gonna get a lot more detail out of the book. You're gonna get a lot more imagery. Uh, they're gonna have a lot of pictures of the pieces and the parts that you're gonna need to know. So I highly recommend that you use that resource first. So um, before watching this uh, video where I'm gonna just go over the highlights of it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, yeah, skip a few slides ahead. We're not gonna be going through this. The module objectives here by the end of this module will be disassembling. You'll know how to disassemble and reassemble a, a desktop computer safely, emphasis on the word safely, and identify the external ports and major components inside a desktop. We're gonna describe how they connect and are compatible, identify various tools you need as a computer hardware technician, uh, disassemble and reassemble a laptop computer safely, and identify various external ports and slots and major internal components. Understand special concerns when supporting and maintaining laptops. So without further ado, let's get into that. So uh, a couple of uh, guidelines for protecting yourself and the equipment, including the following. Remove loose jewelry. You don't want any types of uh, uh, bracelets or anything like that that will get hung on something or uh, you know possibly damage uh, something inside there. Uh, you also want to watch out uh, because some computer cases have sharp edges and you can really slice yourself pretty badly. I've done that before in the past. Um, also, never remove the cover or put your hands inside the monitor or power supply. There are things in there that can hurt you, things in there that can kill you. You don't want to get shocked, so do not open up that power supply. And yeah, be very careful uh, about working around a monitor. Uh, when you are going to work on a computer, you should always power it down and unplug it from the wall. Uh, you should uh, press and hold the power button for three seconds to completely drain the power. Sometimes it may be a little bit more than three seconds, depending on the system. Uh, you should never touch the inside of a computer that is turned on. That is a common sense thing, I would hope. And uh, always wear an ESD strap or use a ground mat if an ESD strap is not available. So, uh, you know, electrostatic, uh, uh, the electrostatic uh, discharge strap isn't as needed in Hawaii as it is in most places, but I would advise you use it. Uh, we have a lot of moisture in the air here, and we don't have as much trouble with the uh, electrostatic uh, buildup that you do in the mainland, but this is still something to be concerned about. And if you ever decide to move to the mainland, of course, you're gonna need it there too. Um, also, uh, place equipment in an anti-static bag. Uh, I personally don't follow that one uh, as much, but you do want to take care of the things as you're disassembling it and put it in a place where it's not going to get damaged. So step one, planning and organizing your work and gathering your tools. So it's very important that you make notes for backtracking. Uh, the book talks a lot about uh, using, you know, writing down things or uh, keeping track of it. I, I also take videos and take pictures with my cell phone because it's quite easy and convenient to see it at different stages. And uh, that's, you know, that's something that you can consider when doing this. Uh, it says stay organized by keeping small parts in one place. I've seen people use tiny uh, Dixie cups to put screws in, screws of like size, you know, uh, together. I've seen people use uh, silicon mats with little uh, section, you know, little tiny uh, indents where you can put the screws for different parts. And those are very helpful. Um, 
Let's see, some essential tools used by a computer hardware technician include the ESD uh, strap, uh, the ground bracelet. You know, it basically uh, grounds you uh, in, you know, you attach one end to your wrist and the other uh, attaches to uh, somewhere in the frame of the computer for grounding. Uh, you'll need both a flathead screwdriver and a Phillips head uh, screwdriver. Honestly, I see more Phillips head uh, screws than flatheads. Uh, also, uh, you may need a Torx screwdriver set. I have to say, though, I've rarely needed a Torx screwdriver. I've uh, disassembled a lot of hard drives for fun. And then you definitely need a Torx screwdriver then. But uh, yeah, so a, a size T15, uh, keep one of those handy. Insulated tweezers are also very uh, handy and they can help you uh, work with small things whether it's picking up screws or uh, pulling out uh, zero and or, you know, working with uh, small ribbon cables and things like that. Uh, step two, opening the case. And this is, uh, yeah, uh, one of nine here. Uh, so a computer case for any type of computer is sometimes called the chassis. You know, we call that body, the frame of it, the chassis. And it houses the power supply, the motherboard, the processor, memory modules, expansion cards, hard drives, optical drives, and other drives, your video cards, everything, it goes in here. Uh, it can also be a tower case, which is uh, one that's you know quite tall. It can be a desk type, uh, desktop case. Those come in different uh, you know sizes and shapes. Uh, it can be an all-in-one case, or it can be a, a mobile case. So uh, you've got different uh, form factors there. And also uh, loopback plugs are used to test a network port in a computer or other device to make sure the port is working. Uh, I don't see a lot of people using those, honestly, but it's something that they mentioned, so be aware of this. Uh, and you can also uh, use that to test the throughput of uh, or speed of uh, port. As always, it's important to back up important data before you do any work like this. Make sure that you have a backup of anything on that hard drive before you start doing things. Uh, you should power down the system and unplug it along with all the other per peripherals as well. You need to press and hold the power button for about three seconds. Uh, you need to have a plastic bag or uh, cups handy to hold those screws. I would have multiple cups because just one, you're gonna mix screws of all sorts and sizes. One thing that I've done is to get little Dixie cups and in the order that I disassemble, I'll put all the screws for the first part in one cup, second in another and third. And then when you're going to put it back together, you're gonna be working in the opposite uh, you know, direction with your cups. So that's just a little thing that I do personally. Um, the next step is to open the case cover, else how are we gonna do anything? Uh, and there's many ways of opening a case. There's some that are just nice little pull tabs. Some of them have, uh, you know, you'll unscrew the backs of it and slide off the case. There's, you know, each one is its own little snowflake, you know, different uh, style. Um, and also, uh, once you've opened the case cover, you're going to clip on your, uh, you're going to have your, uh, your ESD strap and you're going to clip it to somewhere inside the computer case for grounding. So here's an image of the, uh, the case. So looking into it generally, um, I have actually dealt with a lot different ones. So um, this one shows your motherboard uh, up at the top and it's got the power supply at the bottom. Uh, most of my life, it's been the opposite. I've had the power supply up in the top uh, of it and the motherboard below it going all the way down to the bottom. And then over in what's here, the, uh, the lower right corner, you've got the hard disk uh, slots. And above it all the way at the top, you've got the optical DVD CD drive and you've got the front of the case. You can also see that there's a couple of uh, big fans uh, that are not marked up on the front side and those will be run, you'll have cables that run from there to uh, different fan connectors on your motherboard. But uh, what's curious about this is that they still list the optical DVD CD drive in here because nowadays I'm finding it's less and less common to have uh, optical drives because there's not a lot of people using CDs and DVDs anymore. Most things are on flash or you know, they're downloadable media. So anyway, uh, this is the inside of the the computer. Uh, it does mark where your uh, processor is under the CPU fan there. You've got the motherboard, which is the large you know, thing in the background there. Um, it's green and it's got all this, these, you know, things on it. Uh, you know, it's got the chipset. It's got the 
uh, the slots for your uh, cards and it's got uh, connectors for your SATA data cables. So there's a lot going on there, but uh, anyway, oh, and at the bottom it shows the power cord. So you've got a number of uh, power uh, cables that are gonna come out of your power supply. And those uh, cables will be hooked up to different points. You'll have one that goes into the motherboard, uh, actually two uh, or so that go into the motherboard. Some will go into a video card if it's a big honking fast uh, you know, video card and the others will go to the drives to supply them power. So um, moving on, the main components installed in the case include the following and we went over this, the motherboard processor and cooler. Uh, the cooler uh, is, you know, there's different styles of coolers, but uh, fans are a popular thing. Some people do water cooling and whatnot, but uh, yeah, I'm not so, uh, I'm not so elegant with mine. I just use uh, standard fans to cool mine down. I'm not doing a lot of overclocking either. So yeah, there's not much need for uh, serious cooling in my systems. Uh, so expansion cards, uh, memory modules, hard drives and other drives in the power supply. And we saw that in the last image. So over here is uh, your DIMMs, uh, your, uh, your uh, RAM essentially. So depending on the motherboard, it will have a different number of uh, DIMM slots. Uh, here it's four, four is kind of the standard and you will have different ways of uh, putting in memory. Sometimes you have, you know, and you also uh, have to match memory often. So like uh, sticks and everything. So when you put them in, uh, you'll you'll need to consult your motherboard manual to see you know what the configurations are for them. But uh, anyhow, in this one it says a DIM holds RAM and is mounted directly on a motherboard. Uh, what you do to actually put those in before you do it, you see the little white tabs. You have those uh, pulled to the side so that they're open, and then you look at the memory module and the memory module is gonna have a notch on it. And that notch is gonna match up with uh, the little slot in the over here. Not, It's not quite in the center, but it's off center. Uh, so you wanna match up uh, your notch in the, the memory with here. And then if you just press it straight down evenly uh, using even force on the sides of it, it should snap into place. Often the white uh, tabs on the side will pop up with it. If not, you can manually do that. But uh, be careful in here because uh, I've seen people get cut uh, while trying to put in, uh, you know, putting too much force onto a, a one of the DIM modules, and you know, actually uh, get themselves a little bit of a paper cut like cut. So just be careful. And uh, one thing that it shows in here, uh, there's two things to to see uh, over here uh, next to the DIM slots. This is. Uh, uh, I think it's a 2032, a CR2032 uh, battery that uh, stores your ROM settings. Then over beside it here is one of the uh, power connectors for the motherboard. That's not really covered here, but that's just to let you know. And then, oh, over here next to the memory that it's got slotted, you can see the small, uh, the power uh, input for the drive fan. Actually, I think that's the CPU fan. So it right here is the, the fan connector. So it gets power. So next we're gonna talk about form factors. The form factors used by desktop cases, power supplies and motherboards. So the standards uh, that describe the size, shape, screw hole positions and major features of those interconnected components are called form factors. The form factors are necessary so that they'll all be compatible with each other. So two form factors used most by, uh, are used by most desktop and tower computer cases and power supplies include the ATX, which is the advanced technology extended and the micro ATX sizes. And I don't know if they have an image of that in here, um, but an ATX power supply has a variety of power connectors, which we saw uh, previously. Uh, and they include a four pin and an eight pin auxiliary connector used to provide an uh, additional 12 volts of power for evolving CPUs. You've got a 24 or uh, 20 plus four pin P1 connector, the older 20 pin uh, P1 connector still uh, worked in this connector. It supported the new PCI Express slots. And then you've got the six pin and eight pin PCIe connectors connected directly to the video card because the video cards nowadays draw the most power in the system. Back in the old days, it wasn't this way. It used to be you just take a little video card, a small little thing and plug it in there and no problems. But you know these are not GPUs anymore. These are, you know, the ones from the old days were a lot less powered than the ones that we use now. So yeah, it's an evolving world. 
So uh, here um, it's showing, uh, it says the, the PCIe uh, 16 video card has a six pin PCIe power connector to re uh, receive extra power from the power supply. And you can see at the end there, they show the six pin connector uh, over here. So it's gonna be on the back of it. So once you plug this in, you're gonna to have to supply power to it to, uh, to use this card. So that is an example of the energy hog in your system. Um, so the micro ATX uh, form factor is a major variation of ATX. It reduces the total cost of a system by implementing the following. It reduces the number of expansion slots that you have on the motherboard. It reduces the power supplied to the motherboard and it allows for a smaller case size. And this is really important. Uh, it, particularly when you think about office applications, a lot of offices like the one I work in, I'm a developer and I don't need a big honking system to do it. I'm not dealing with graphics. I'm dealing with essentially uh, compiling code and things like that. So on my desk at work, I have a computer that's a, it's a micro ATX. It's the size of a book. I mean, it's really small. It's wonderful. It's got 16 gigs of RAM on it. It's plenty fast. And I don't have much need for more than that. But uh, you know, it, it's wonderful to have something that fits in such a small form factor. Uh, I, but in the job that I had before that, I had a desktop and the desktop full ATX form factor, it was massive and it's heavy. And uh, I honestly can't say that it had any more performance than the one that I use currently, which is the size of a book. So yeah, so the micro ATX, uh, I, I really like them personally. Um, but getting back here, uh, the micro ATX form factor uses a 24 pin P1 connector is not likely to have as many uh, extra wires and connectors as those on the ATX power supply, because you know, you're know you not gonna have a lot of slots. You're not gonna be supplying a lot of extra power to it. So that is the reason. So uh, if we're moving components, you need to draw a diagram of all cable connections to the motherboard expansion cards and drives. Also, again, I'll say this again, take out your phone, take pictures of it, take very detailed pictures of the connectors and you know, things to let you know where things were specifically. That's very helpful in this day and age. Um, so to remove expansion cards, do the following, remove any wire or cable connected to the card. Uh, this is you know, to free it so you can pull it out and set it aside. Uh, you'll, uh, for most of them, you'll have a screw that holds it, uh, the card into the case. There are newer styles, which uh, like in Dell's, I believe, you may just have some kind of a bar that comes down and holds it into place so you don't have to screw it. But uh, the vast majority still use a, a retaining screw to keep the card in the case. So you wanna grasp the card, when you're pulling it out, you wanna grasp the card with both hands and remove it by lifting up. And you may have to slightly uh, you know, do this because you're pulling it out of the, you know, it, you're gonna be pulling it out of the slot and it's, it's really snugly fit in there. So it may take a little bit of coaxing there. So um, uh, don't put your fingers on the edge connectors or touch a chip uh, for obvious reasons. Um, going on, we're gonna be, uh, oh, depending on the system, uh, you may have to remove the drives and or power supply to get to the mo motherboard. The way some of these fit together and each case is different, you know, you'll look at it and you'll see there's an order to it. You know, when I open it up and I look at it first and I, I take all the cables off, I'm like, okay, uh, is there enough room to remove all of my cards without pulling out the optical drive or something like that from the front end? Sometimes they get in the way. So you'll have to look at it and kind of figure out, uh, do I need to remove these before these? But uh, if if there are no uh, space uh, limitations there, I often just go and remove all of my uh, cards first. And then if I need to remove other things, I can remove that. But if you're gonna replace a motherboard and you've got enough clearance, often you can just remove your peripherals, unplug all the power, take out the peripherals, set those aside, uh, be careful with all your screws and everything. But you're going to, uh, you can often get away with not uh, detaching your power supply or your uh, optical drives uh, and things like that. So uh, I, it's not always the case, but it's often the case that you can get away with that. So um, getting back to our instructions. Uh, so we unplug the power supply lines. Uh, we unplug the SATA cables connected to the motherboard, uh, disconnect the wires leading from the front of the computer case to the motherboard, because these are the front panel connectors. They have like the, you've got buttons in the front that are for like restart uh, for, you know, turning it on, turning it off, 
Uh, you you know, all those things. And also you have little connectors that control the little LED lights that come on, like for uh, power on and uh, hard drive activity. So all those are little cables that uh, go and uh, connect to the front panel, but they're your front panel connectors. So they go from there to different various points on the motherboard. So you'll need to uh, remove those as well from the motherboard. Uh, disconnect any other cables or wires that are connected to the motherboard. Um, remove the screws that hold the motherboard to the case. So on a case, and this is where the form factors come in, you have, uh, so consider this to be the plane of the, uh, of the back of the case or whatever you're going to be putting the, the motherboard onto. There are spacers in there, little metal spacers often. And those spacers, you'll put the motherboard down on top of it. The spacer will keep it off of the metal chassis. And then you'll put the screws into these little things. So the ATN, the form factor defines pretty much where the holes are going to be for your screws. So you'll have a number of screws, six, eight. I'm not sure what the exact number is. You know, it depends on the the motherboard, but you've got tons of places where you can secure the motherboard down to the, the chassis. So uh, you'll have to remove those screws. Again, take a picture of it so you'll know the area that it was in. So th these are all going to be uniform size, so put all those in a separate cup as well. Uh, so removing the uh, motherboard uh, post-diagnostic cards uh, can help discover and report computer errors and conflicts at uh, power on self test. So uh, Post is power on self test. So um, firmware programs and data stored on the motherboard. Post is a series of tests performed by the startup, the BIOS, the UFI. Uh, so uh, you can use diagnostic cards to uh, figure out if you've got problems going on when you're uh, booting up like that. So if you have a problem that prevents the computer from booting and you suspect it's related to hardware, do the following. Install the post card and expansion slot on the motherboard. And uh, then you know the card's going to monitor the boot process and it's going to report the errors for you, so you'll get an idea of what's going wrong. And uh, it's this is a, a nice piece of equipment. I had one for much older systems in the past, and uh, it, it helps out you know when you've got issues going on. Uh, so to remove the power supply from the case, you want to do the following: you look for the uh, screws, and there's usually four that attach the power supply to the computer case. You do not want to remove the screws that uh, hold the power supply housing together. And I've seen a lot of people accidentally do that because they'll get a little bit overzealous. They'll, un they'll undo the four on the back. And you know, after you do that, there's still other screws on there, but you don't need to touch any of that. You, there's no reason in all my years and 30 years building computers, I've never had to open up the power supply to go in there. And there's things in there that could shock you literally and yeah, in a bad health way. So don't 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 open up the power supply. Um, so sometimes power supplies are also attached to the case on the underside by recessed slots. So in that case, turn the case over and look for those slots. If they're present, then determine which direction you need to slide it to get the power supply free from the case. And again, uh, you know, all you know, it's there are a lot of general rules for doing things, but you know, when you look at a computer, you're just going to be playing detective and figure out how it goes. But yeah, there's, you'll get used to it after a while and you'll get used to different uh, styles. The most difficult, I would say, is when you're dealing with a proprietary brand like Dell, because sometimes they put things together a little bit differently than others and it's a little bit more complicated. So uh, Apple products too are a pain in the butt for being proprietary systems, but I'll just shelve that comment for later. Um, you can also uh, use a power supply tester and I've got one in the other room. Uh, you can use a power supply tester to test the output of each connector uh, on your power supply and that's really important. So in this picture, they've got uh, an old uh, style uh, power supply and they've got the different, uh, those are, well, the one they have plugged in right there is the, uh, that's the power to motherboard. So you can test it and make sure that it's working properly. And those are really nice because power supplies can be finicky, uh, especially when they're malfunctioning and using one of these can help detect when you've got a bad power supply. Another thing that uh, you know computer people should be a little bit more uh, used to using and yet they're not is uh, one of these things right here. Uh, this is a uh, 
It's a voltmeter, basically a multimeter. So you can do all kinds of things. One of the most important things to do is test continuity. So you can test that, you know, you can get, uh, you know, your, your electricity is going from one end to another. And that's really important. So uh, this is showing you what a multimeter looks like. And it's uh, showing you all the different parts of it. So multimeters are important in, uh, you know, well, in electronics too. So, uh, but uh, when you're, when you're trying to find issues with your computers, this can really be a, a handy thing. All right, so a drive uh, receives power by a power cable, duh, from the power supply and communicates instructions and data through a cable attached to the motherboard. So tips to remove drives, look for screws on each side of the drive attached to the drive, uh, attaching the drive to the drive bay. And this is a many splendid thing too. There are different styles. Uh, I've got in my, uh, like in my uh, network attached storages, they now have it, it's, it's not screwed in anymore. They just have this beautiful little, a little uh, chassis like thing that you slide the thing into and then you use a plastic thing that has little fangs in it and you just put that on and it holds the drive into the chassis and you just slide it in. And that's really convenient. You've got different versions of that going back a long time but you've got plastic things that would slide into uh, into slots in the you know in the ATX or in, inside your chassis. There's all kinds of styles here, but um, you know it mentioned some of this. It's like there may be a catch underneath the drive. Some drive bays have a clipping mechanism, like kind of like I mentioned to hold the drive in the bay. Uh, some of them don't. Sometimes you'll have to push in on the little clicking uh, on the mechanism on the side before you can pull it out. Uh, it's just one of those where you're going to have to look at it and kind of poke around and see how is this going to pull out. But uh, yeah, look for little uh, uh, latches that you know you can push in on the side and then pull it out because usually they do lock in uh, somehow. Uh, that is again, if you have optical drives, DVD drives, stuff like that. So um, a lot of them can be removed from the front of the case. So after you uh, detach that, you pull them out. Some of them, uh, you may have a removable bay for uh, smaller hard drives too. Uh, it just, they're all different. So uh, just look for the way of doing it. Sometimes your hard drives, instead of being mounted in the front where you can just pull them out, sometimes you, know, you have to pull them out from the side. Sometimes they'll be mounted into the side of your chassis and you can just uh, unscrew them and then pull the whole thing off. So yeah, everyone is different, honestly. Here is an example of uh, one where it's uh, got a little latch mechanism there. So you've got to remove, uh, you've got to release the clip uh, before you can pull it out. So uh, yeah, you, if you pull that, then you'll be able to slide out the front. Uh, this one, it's interesting. I don't know, because uh, I can't see the other side of it, but you may have to do it on both sides. It could be that with this being a, a specific brand, it could be that you only have to release it on one side. But yeah, it just depends on the maker. Proprietary is always going to be special. So you should refer to any diagrams created during the disassembling process. Uh, install components in this order: power supplies, drives, motherboard, and cards. You know, up till now we've been taking it apart, and taking it apart is fun. But in the back of your head, you should always be thinking: okay, when I go to put it back together, I need to remember to do this. And this is the terror that we find ourselves in now making sure that we put everything back together just the way it was before, except working. So um, so anyway, we're gonna install it in this order, power supply first, if we've had to take it out at all, the drives, if we've had to take them out, usually the motherboard's coming out at some point, especially if you're replacing motherboard. Uh, if you're just doing like a dim replacement or something, you're not gonna go through all this, but you know what we're talking about is totally stripping the whole thing down because this is a, an, another reason why you may wanna strip down a system, dusting. It's, it's really important to keep your system dust free. And it is amazing how much dust can accumulate in there over just a, a year's period. So I like to every year or so totally disassemble the computer and dust it out entirely. And that's just a little personal clean fetish that I have, but uh, it, it's a good thing to try to do. And for a situation like that, sure, taking off even the motherboard is a, a good idea because you get in there and get everything you know separated out. So uh, then when installing drives, it may be easier to connect the cables to the drives before sliding them into the bay. And yeah, that, that's something like, uh, because 
you may not have the ability to work with it, you know, once you get the drive in there and you're, you know, you're dealing with something you can't see as well. If you've got the cables, you can hook them up before you put them in, then slide them in. That can be of help. Uh, place the motherboard inside the case. How else are you going to do it? Uh, make sure the ports and the screw uh, holes are lined up. And that can be a little bit tricky sometime, but, you know, you try to line up one or two, line up one over here, line up one over in the corner. And if you've got like opposing corners kind of lined up, most of the other parts are going to fall in. So uh, fall into place. So uh, just go ahead and uh, do one start to screw it in down there, start to screw down there. And then you uh, start to put in your other screws too, and then tighten them all up. But uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself there. But uh, uh, after you've uh, made sure your ports and screw holes are all lined up, then you're going to con connect the power cords from the power supply to the motherboard. And as I said, you've got the main one and then you've got the auxiliary one as well. Um, and you're gonna connect the lead, uh, the wire leads from the front panel that we were talking about with your LEDs and your power uh, button and everything else. We're gonna connect those onto the motherboard and help orient the larger connectors. Look for a small triangle embedded on the connector that's gonna tell you uh, what uh, your uh, pin one is. Uh, so you're gonna line up the pin one with the uh, pin one on the motherboard and uh, hopefully it has a pin one marking, but if not, it's usually a little uh, triangle. So if you look on the, the black uh, uh, connector, it'll have a, a bit of a triangle, an elongated triangle there. So just line those up. So then connect the wires to the ports on the front panel of the case. Audio ports or USB ports are examples. Um, here we have, if you look at it, uh, you'll see a front audio connector or a front audio header up there. So uh, you'll connect things like that. Uh, the other one, you've got your USB headers uh, as well for uh, you know, uh, you know, hooking up your USB ports. So make sure you've got all of those hooked up. Um, then we're gonna install the video card and other expansion cards that you have in there. You wanna double check each connection, uh, plug in your keyboard, your monitor and your mouse. So now we're getting to the outside of your box. And then uh, if this is a classroom envi environment, have the instructor check your work. Sure, why not? Um, then turn on the power and check that the PC is working properly. If not, it's usually a loose connection. So um, that's pretty much uh, easy to follow. And now we have the knowledge check activity 1-1. So you disassemble and reassemble a desktop computer. When you first turn it on, you see no lights and hear no sounds. Nothing appears under the monitor screen. What is the most likely cause of the problem? So let's think about this. Uh, a memory module is not seated properly in a memory slot. So would that cause it not to do anything on boot up? I say no, because usually when you start to turn it on, things start worrying and coming to life. A memory module uh, being not seated properly will usually lead to a beeping uh, situation. You'll hear like a series of beeps, but you're not gonna have it not start up at all. So then uh, you forgot to plug in the monitor's external power cord. What does a monitor have to do with the motherboard not starting up? Let's say absolutely nothing. So then a wire in the case is obstructing a fan. That's interesting. So I would say if you had a wire obstructing a fan, you'll probably hear it uh, making a, a kind of a, a, not a rattling sound, but you know a, an abrasive sound as it, as it hits it. Then the last thing would be power cords to the motherboard are not connected. Ding, 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 we have a winner. So I say it would be D and yay, the answer is D. Power cords of the motherboard are not connected because we're not getting any response when we turn it on. We're not getting any, you know, anything, no fans are, you know, kicking in, no beeps or anything. It's just flat dead. So it sounds like power. So it says all the other answers would still allow the system to start the boot, even though it might fail. If the motherboard is not getting powered, it will not start the boot. So there we go. Now we're gonna talk about laptop computers. And these are less fun because laptops are often proprietary. They're always proprietary. And because they're proprietary, uh, yeah, all bets are off in terms of conformity to standards. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it, it's just a lot more difficult, especially if you own an Apple product, they are probably not unintentionally difficult to deal with. But anyway, let's go through that. So a laptop is designed for portability and can be just as powerful as a desktop computer. Uh, I'm actually right now using a uh, laptop, a MacBook Pro that is inside a, uh, well, it's, it's hooked up to a dock uh, station. 
So I do use laptops, but when they go awry, they are miserable to deal with. But anyway, a variety of uh, laptops include those with a touch screen that allow you to hand write on it with a stylus, thinking like the, um, the uh, Windows, uh, gosh, the word uh, escapes me right now, but uh, Windows has one. You've got your uh, iPad Pro type uh, devices. Uh, you've got netbooks. Uh, you've got uh, the all-in-one computer. It has like a, a, a monitor and the whole computer is built inside it, uh, ports and all. Um, so here's an example of the three. You've got, uh, you've got A, which is looks to be just a, a regular Windows uh, system. B looks to be probably a netbook, I'm guessing, uh, because it's a little bit, yeah, the second one's a, a netbook. And then the third one is your all-in-one computer. So, oh yeah, it's, it's written there. I should have read that. Um, so anyways, uh, ports common to laptops include the uh, USB, the network, and the audio ports. So when a laptop is missing a port or slot, you can use a USB dongle to provide the uh, port or slot. And this happens a lot. This is also a way. So when something goes wrong on a laptop and it's going to be expensive to fix, or if, you know, like uh, for example, if you have a problem with uh, a port not working, you know, you could get around it by maybe using an, an available uh, port to, or you know, for example, you know. Uh, I had a USB port go bad and I had another USB port and I just put an expansion uh, uh, for, you know, a four port expansion uh, unit in there and was able to use it. Uh, when the uh, when the ethernet uh, wasn't working that well, I could get uh, what it mentions here, which is a USB to RJ45 dongle. You know, RJ45 is just a, uh, it's a like a Cat5 cable, the connector, uh, that's referring to the connector itself. So uh, you can use a USB, uh, you, like if your Wi-Fi isn't working, uh, you can uh, use a RJ545, a USB to RJ45 dongle to connect to a wired network, or you can actually uh, do the same thing for a wireless. You can, uh, if your wireless isn't working, you can uh, use a little USB uh, adapter for wireless and you know connect to the wireless uh, network. Um, you can also do the same thing for Bluetooth. Usually laptops have Bluetooth uh, built in, but uh, a lot of desktops these days don't have Bluetooth, and I don't understand it. So you often have to go out and I, I just so happen to have right here uh, a Bluetooth connector because I have to uh, do, uh, I, I have to hook up a wireless uh, headphone to my daughter's uh, computer and it didn't come with Bluetooth. So you have to buy a little dongle for that. So sometimes you're adding functionality. Sometimes this is a workaround to uh, expensive repairs. Uh, and so particularly on laptops, you know, you, if you're, Ethernet uh, adapter isn't working. You can use a USB, you know, uh, dongle for that. You can, you know, again, the Wi-Fi dongle if your Wi-Fi isn't working, or if your Bluetooth is, you know, not working properly, you can, you know, get one of these handy dandy uh, Bluetooth connectors as well. And they're not expensive. Uh, the RJ45, uh, well, the wired one, I think they ran twenty to thirty dollars for my Mac, and probably around the same for a wireless. Wireless, depending on the the standard, you can get them for. I don't know, seven to ten dollars even. They're not going to be the better, uh, you know, types. They're not going to be like ACAX or whatever. They're going to be like a wireless N or something like that. But you can still find them. And if you go on eBay, you can get them really cheap. But uh, I think this uh, Bluetooth one cost maybe seven dollars, seven to ten dollars. So we're not talking about expensive fixes. And going in and having your uh, MacBook Pro uh, fixed to get the, you know if you're out of warranty to get the, you know, the ethernet fixed, that's going to run you a couple hundred at least. So uh, yeah, sometimes it's better just to get a little dongle. Now docking stations and port replicators. This is the fun stuff. I have a uh, docking station that I can't really show you on my system right now, but uh, I am able to essentially have my laptop in a little uh, stand and I put one single plug into it, a, a USB-C plug. That USB-C plug goes to the docking station. So all my peripherals plug into the docking station. My two monitors that I use plug into the docking station. My ethernet, uh, my gigabit uh, ethernet connector is from the docking station. Uh, my speakers connect to the docking station. Everything connects to the docking station. So now if I want, my wife's computer to uh, you know be on here. All I have to do is pull out the one little cable and put it into her system, and now everything, even the uh, the mouse and the keyboard, are you know because they're connected to the docking station. She can use them on her system now. 
So it's really wonderful to have a, you know, a system like that where you can just, you know, take one plug out because if I'm on the go, I'll take out my laptop and I'll, I'll move with it. Then when I get home, I just plug in the one USB-C cable and now I'm able to fully spread out across my desktop again. It, it's really nice. But, you know, as it says here, you can share your full size monitor, your keyboard, your AC adapter and other things. So even though I've got a laptop, I use it as a full desktop system by using this docking station. And then there's port replicators. And I kind of alluded to that earlier. Uh, it's uh, with a universal docking station. Uh, it's a device that provides ports to allow a la laptop to easily connect to peripheral devices. So like I said earlier, you, you could have a four port uh, USB-A uh, uh, expansion thing there, but you can also have it uh, you know, with HDMI connectors on it or uh, you know, SDHC card readers, things like that. And to uh, use a docking station or port replicator, uh, plug all your peripherals into the docking station of the port replicator and then connect that to the laptop. So uh, it's just really convenient. And I highly recommend it for anybody that likes that, uh, you know, likes to work on the go, but then, you know, likes to have a big desktop experience at home. Uh, so the second, so this is an example of uh, a docking station for a Lenovo ThinkPad and uh, it's a decent one, but you look in the back. Uh, so you look in the back, you see that ethernet connector next to the yellow uh, dot. Um, that that ethernet connector is, that's what they call the RJ45. And then you've got some USB-A ports. And if you go over, you've got a VGA port. So yeah, so if you've got a, um, a monitor that was built a hundred years ago, you could attach it to this thing and use it. So uh, yeah, so there's VGA on there. Normally you're gonna have something like a, um, you're gonna have uh, HDMI or uh, what is it? The, um, not DVI, but uh, they have um, different uh, types of uh, video ports on the back there that you can uh, utilize. So um, yeah, but VGA, I'm just kind of surprised to see it here. Uh, moving along, uh, laptops and the replacement parts cost more than desktop PCs. Yes, because we're miniaturizing it and we're in a proprietary system, so it's gonna cost more to repair. So factors to consider that apply more to laptop than uh, desktop computers, the original, uh, what we call the OEM warranty, how long is that thing under warranty for, uh, the service manuals and diagnostic software provided by the manufacturer, the customized installation of the OS that is unique to laptops, and the need to order replacement parts directly from the laptop manufacturer or authorized source. Because sometimes those pieces need to be bought there. Uh, if you're looking at memory and stuff like that though, even though I've got a Mac, which is a highly specialized thing, you can still get the memory for that. Like if you're wanting to upgrade your memory, you can still get that from third party places and they'll have, uh, you know, they'll have you look up like what type of system you have, what Euro is developed and everything. And uh, you can, you can pretty safely buy those things. But if you're looking for like speakers and things like that for a specific, like a Lenovo or something else, don't go with generic. You'll want to get the uh, OEM for that, but you know, just be prepared to pay more for that than you would for a desktop upgrade because desktops being more modular, it's easier to get those replacement parts, whereas the laptops are a lot different. So anyway, be prepared. Uh, so warranty concerns, always check to see if the laptop is under warranty before servicing. Uh, when contacting the technical support, have the following available, the laptop model, the serial number, the purchaser name, phone number, and address. Uh, usually they'll ask you phone number and address just to record that uh, purchaser name. Yeah, that goes without, you know, but they really they need the laptop model and the serial port to see if you registered it and to know if you're still under warranty. So service manuals and other sources of information. Service manuals save time. Uh, they enable safe uh, laptop disassembly. It's nice to have them to uh, follow the directions because some systems being uh, proprietary are a little bit obtuse trying to figure out how to do things inside it. Or if they're like an Apple, they won't have any to begin with. So, yay. Um, this is, this is uh, the HP website. It's uh, giving you instructions for uh, troubleshooting and replacing uh, components in there. So they actually have somebody using what looks like a spudger to, to separate the plastic uh, on there to do uh, repairs themselves. So uh, that's nice to see. So most laptop manufacturers provide uh, diagnostic software that can help you test the components to determine uh, which components need replacing. I use uh, HP's and Dell's and they have very good uh, sources for that. HP particularly, you go to their website, 
often they can uh, look and automatically detect what system you've got. And uh, you know, you can go through, uh, you can really get through the whole support process a lot quicker that way. I really like it. Um, but anyways, uh, you can do that testing in a somewhat automated fashion. Uh, so sources include the manufacturer's website, CDs that are bundled with the notebook or on the hard drive itself, if you can ever find them. Uh, I remember uh, when I worked at the, my previous company, we would have a box that the motherboard came in and we would put all of our uh, computer related things into that box. So it would have all the manuals, it would have all the CDs and uh, different things that would be you know, connected to that computer. We just keep it in the motherboard box. And then we put that on a shelf that we'd forget about. So when it finally, we did have a problem two or three years later, it was like, what do we do with that? And then we go looking for the box and if we still had the box around or if it wasn't buried under clutter, we'd take it out and we could look through things. But by that point we were like, well, that part's no good anymore. We can replace it for a fifth of the cost that it used to be. So it wasn't that big a deal. We weren't looking to repair something. We we're just looking to swap it out at that point, but yeah. So anyway, um, continuing on, it may uh, become necessary to open a laptop case to upgrade memory change a hard drive or replace a failed component. Most, system that, uh, most systems, those components are easily accessible unless you're Apple, that's a whole different story. But uh, upgrading your memory, usually you'll see it uh, you know, once you open up. Sometimes there'll be a, a special little slot that you just open up that slot and you can see the memory. It's good to dust it out too because it'll get really dusty. So uh, when you upgrade your, uh, you can put in new memory uh, or expand it if there's spaces to uh, put in new DIMM chips there. Um, so, and the hard drive is usually pretty accessible as well as the battery from what I recall. And I've replaced a couple of batteries on laptops before. And it's, uh, unless it's an Apple, it's, it's not that difficult usually. And you can buy the parts pretty much online. So um, screws and nuts on a laptop are smaller than a desktop, requiring smaller tools. This is true. And you really need to be careful about losing them because they'll disappear in a crease in your shirt if you drop them. So uh, yeah, be careful when dealing with that. Again, I really do highly recommend you use little Dixie cups for that. Um, so working on laptops requires extra patience. It really does, and a swear jar is another thing that's very important. You'll become rich, or well, somebody else will become rich by the time you finish. Uh, it does take a lot of uh, uh, patience, and again, wear your electrostatic discharge strap. Uh, but again, in Hawaii, it's not as necessary, but better to be safe than sorry. Uh, and here's, here's some advice that I never followed, but I really think it's good. Tape your screws on a piece of paper or beside the menu, uh, or beside the manu uh, manufacturer's documentation. So, if you're looking through a book and it has step by step, go out to Walmart. They have those little baggies uh, that uh, in the jewelry section. You can put your screws into a baggie and then just tape that into the onto the part of the instructions. Or if you're like me, you just take pictures of where you are in the process of disassembling, and then you have your screws in order. But put in a little baggie like that. They're they're really cheap. You get a hundred for not that much money at Walmart, and then just put them into that baggie and then you know go in the reverse order as you put it back together. Um, but yeah, that was a good idea about taping the screws uh, on a piece of paper or something in the documentation. And then work methodically to keep your screws and your components organized because yeah, the screw depths are different depending on what part of the system you're in and you really wanna keep those uh, separate so you're not damaging things. Um, and here's an example of taping the screws next to the images. And I think this is a wonderful idea that I never followed in 30 years of uh, actually doing this stuff, but it, it really is a good idea. Um, a few tips to consider when disassembling a laptop include the following, find the hardware service manual, because again, it's proprietary and it may not be intuitive. Uh, opening the case might void the warranty. That might actually not be, now with the, the whole uh, right to repair movement going on, this may not be as accurate. Uh, be aware if they have avoiding the warranty thing, but it may not actually hold up in court. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, also take your time and do not force anything. That's the way you end up breaking things. And uh, yeah, so just take your time. Don't force open things. If you're working with a spudger to separate things, go slow and you know gentle as you move along there. 
<clears throat> pry up your plastic covers with dental pick or screwdriver or spudger. Uh, plastic screws uh, may be used only once, uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, disassemble your components in order, reassemble them in uh, the reverse order. Uh, use a plastic or metal spudger to slide along the seal and pry it open. So when you finally get access into it, then you kind of slide it along to slowly open up the rest of it. Then, um, oh yeah, to, to disconnect the ZIF connector, first lift up the lever or locking bar to release the latch. That's very important or else you're gonna rip it apart. And then remove the cable using the pull tab, which is blue on this laptop. So a uh, ZIF is zero insertion force. Uh, so yeah, it shouldn't take any force to insert it there, hence the name. So uh, yeah, you wanna lift that lever up first to release it. And then you can uh, remove the cable by using that pull tab, you know, the blue thing on there. And, you know, sometimes you can use those insulated uh, tweezers that we talked about right there. Um, a list of important components in the typical order, you remove them, you remove or disable the battery pack, remove the hard drive, the memory, the wireless card, the optical drive, crack the case, and remove the keyboard bezel. <laughs> and God help you if you have to remove the backlighting on the monitor, that is never a fun thing to do. I've tried it and I have failed on an HP, I believe. Uh, an all-in-one computer uses a mix of components sized for a desktop and a laptop. For some components, you'll need to uh, buy replacement uh, parts from the manufacturer because they're uh, most likely proprietary. Uh, and so see the service manual for specific directions about replacing parts. Also, uh, if it's still under warranty, it's a good idea to, uh, to send a, an all-in-one back to the manufacturer. I've done that before. Um, yeah, all-in-ones are a bit difficult because they are very proprietary and yeah, dealing with them can be a pain. So, you know, with any luck, you've got it under warranty and you can just send it back. But uh, again, you know, you may need to buy specific proprietary, you know, replacement parts from the manufacturer and those will not be cheap. Um, so here we have the inside of an all-in-one computer and um, you can see the different parts. So if you uh, look in there, you can see the IO controller uh, the optical drive is over in the top uh, left-hand uh, side. The power supply looks very different from the desktop one. And it's that, that's right in the middle of the top. Uh, so it's a lot smaller than the process. You can see it under a, a, a heat sink over there, but notice it's not that, it's not like a heat sink. Uh, it doesn't have the big fan and everything that you'd see on a, a desktop. It's just got the heat sink coming off of the, the chip. So, uh, and then you've got, uh, you notice it says uh, the SODIMs. You've got the two uh, right there. So sometimes, uh, you know, one will be filled if it's a, you know, a cheaper system. You can maybe expand it by, you know, putting in another one, but those will usually flip up and then you can take them out. So it's a little bit different from the desktop. Then uh, you've got your CMOS battery and your mini uh, PCIe card. And uh, then if you look over towards the center, oh, you do have a CPU fan there. So the CPU fan is uh, not where the CPU and uh, the heat sink are. It's, it's actually over uh, down further. So, um, yeah, and then you can see where the, uh, the three and a half inch uh, hard drive is. Uh, that's uh, in the center off to the left. And then uh, the, yeah, the blue uh, brackets hold the hard drive in place there. So that's essentially what the inside of a laptop looks like. And yeah, this one isn't that badly designed, but sometimes you've got to, you know, really dig into different parts and remove one thing before you can see another. So yeah, I, I personally enjoy desktops much more than laptops and I've not had as much experience uh, repairing the, the laptops for that reason. So um, some general guidelines to follow while maintaining these, don't touch the LCD panel with sharp objects. I don't know what's closer to common sense than that. Gee, I can't touch my computer or my screen with a knife, why not? Common sense, uh, do not pick up or hold a laptop by the lid. In other words, don't pick it up by the, you know, the top, you know, your hinges, you know, are gonna be on the weak side there. You can break things. Uh, use only battery packs recommended by the manufacturer because they want to sell you proprietary stuff. Um, do not tightly pack the laptop in a suitcase, use a carrying case. Uh, that's another common sense thing I would think. Do not move while hard drive is being accessed. 
Um, do not uh, put close to appliances generating a strong magnetic field because all of us have had that desire to program next to the microwave, I guess. Um, always use passwords to protect your laptop. Uh, you know, it, it keeps it more secure, not just at the OS level, but, uh, you know, protecting your, uh, you know, in the boot process, you know, keeping a password on there as well as uh, it's a common sense, good thing to do. Um, so now we're going to have another knowledge check. So we've got a four year old laptop. It won't boot and it presents error messages on screen. You have verified with the laptop technical support, but these error messages indicate the wireless card has failed and needs replacing. What is the first step you should take to prepare for the repair? So ask yourself if replacing the wireless card will cost more than purchasing a new laptop. That's something to think about. Um, find a replacement wireless card. Okay, that isn't a bad thing. Find the service manual to show you how to replace the wireless card. That's another thing. And then ask if the laptop is still under warranty. So that's also important. So you think about all these things and they're not bad uh, they're not bad ideas, but you know, look to the question again. What is the first step that you should take to prepare for it? And the first thing you should do, and this is what I think, is you should look and see if it's under warranty. Because as I said before, it really comes down to do you need to do any of the other things? Do you need to find the stuff? If it's under warranty, it's not your problem. It's somebody else's problem at that point. Yes, you'll need to have your uh, hard disk backed up and your data backed up and everything, but you do that all the time because you're really good about computers. So you don't have to worry about that, but you wanna know if it's under warranty and only if it's not under warranty, only then are we gonna have to go back and say, okay, uh, where's the service manual? I gotta do this myself. I have to figure out that. And you know, if you know it's the wireless card, then you're gonna have to find a replacement one. And then, but before you do that, you know, well, when you go to look for a replacement, you're going to see the prices and everything. Then you're going to have to do the weighing of, you know, is it better to replace it or just buy a new one? So there's an order to doing these things in general. And the first thing is to see, is this your problem? Are you going to have to actually do the repairing yourself? And if it's under warranty, yay, we don't have to. So, um, Self-assessment, have you ever worked inside a desktop computer or a laptop computer? Have you? Well, have you? Um, if you haven't, I, I know a lot of people are probably building their own and they're like, yeah, this is easy stuff for me. But uh, you know, a lot of people have never done that before and it's a whole new world when you open it up. And it's a scary thing because when you open it up and it's working perfectly, you know, the thought of taking it apart, now you can possibly break it. And then what are you gonna do? So it can be a daunting thing. And uh, you know, the only way you get around that is you get experience. And usually you get experience when things go wrong. Or in my case, it was, we needed computers for work, so we need to build them. So back in the day when I worked at the infrared, uh, this is dating myself, but uh, UH had the infrared uh, telescope facility, still does. And I was building old Linux systems. So I had to build a Linux system. And my boss said, take this back in the old days when dinosaurs roamed the earth and everything, we had a big magazine. It was like this thick. It looked like a Japanese comic, you know, that you'd find at a, a, a restaurant, but uh, you'd find, you'd take this big old magazine. It was a magazine of entirely, it was called Computer Shopper. And you'd open it up and it would just be nothing but ads for computer parts and places that you can buy them. So I'd go through that thing and I'd have to find the, the different parts that were compatible with each other to build out a computer. And back in that day, I can't remember if it was 486 or if it was Pentium systems yet, but uh, we'd have to find all the parts and we'd have to source them, price them, send in POs and everything, and then uh, order it, wait for weeks for it to come in and then put it together. There was no Amazon back then. We were just ordering it you know, through mail order. And then when we get all the pieces parts together, we'd start assembling it. So that's how I got started. But some other people, I know a lot of people, you know, start out, they want to build a gaming system at home and they're building it or something's wrong with their system and they need to fix it on their own. There may be economic reasons for doing that. There may be, you know, whatever, but uh, they do it on their own. So the next, uh, what measures uh, did you take in order to keep you and the equipment safe? Hopefully you said uh, you didn't touch inside the thing while it was turned on and used an electrostatic uh, discharge strap. Um, or you could be like I was when I started out. One of the first idiotic things I did 
I remember embarrassingly in retrospect, and I'm going to share it with you, is uh, I forgot to turn off power before I slotted a card. And I did it. And my boss looked at me with either amazement or the thought that this is the biggest idiot I've ever seen, but I kept the job. So I'm guessing he was just amazed that nothing went terribly wrong. But um, yeah, you should always have it unplugged and uh, dis you know, disconnected from the wall, not just turned off, uh, disconnect that puppy from the wall, or you can unplug the power supply from the back of that computer. But those are some of the safety things to keep in mind. So now that the lesson has ended, you should be able to disassemble and reassemble a desktop computer safely, identify the external ports and major components inside a desktop, describe how they connect and are compatible, identify the various tools you need as a computer hardware technician. And you should also know to, uh, how to disassemble and reassemble a laptop computer safely, identify the various external ports and slots and major internal components. Does it seem like they've just really done a lot of cut and paste here and just put laptop and desktop in different places? That's what it seems like to me. And then you're supposed to understand uh, special concerns when supporting and maintaining the laptops. So again, this is an experience-based kind of thing. You're not really gonna learn it by watching the slides or reading it in a book. That'll give you a lot of idea of what your components are and some of the terminology that you're gonna need, but really getting into it and doing it is the way you learn anything. So I'll leave you with that. But anyway, I hope this has been informative. If you have any questions, please reach out to me, uh, send me an email. Uh, I'm always happy to uh, respond and or set up a Zoom meeting to follow up. So I uh, look forward to seeing you in the next lesson. Aloha.